We're going to kick it off here just a few minutes past seven. I think there'll be some folks that we might hear clicking on um, in the background as they log on online. Um, but thanks for all of you for coming in person. We have our Autism 206 uh, lecture for the summer, uh, the first of a two-part series on transitioning into adulthood. So tonight's uh, is all about finding a job. And then next month's is the kind of corresponding all about uh, keeping a job. So two very important factors there for sure. Um, I'm David Eaton. I'm one of the nurse practitioners at the Autism Center, filling in for Jim uh, Mancini with our introduction this week. Um, uh, we have three wonderful people uh, talking with us this evening. First, we have, uh, well, not first, second, third, and whoever's going to, I think Richard's going to go first. So Richard Wilson. Um, Richard Wilson is um, with uh, King County. Um, he's the director, the program manager of the King County Developmental Disabilities Division, managing the school to work program specifically. He brings over 30 years of experience to the disabilities field, having served in public and nonprofit positions in the area. Um, he's been working in intervention, advocacy, residential, family, employment services with a wide range of people of developmental, physical, brain trauma, other disabilities. Uh, Richard has his bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Utah, as well as a master's degree from Seattle University. Um, and then we have Maureen Roberts as well. Um, uh, she is a, a case manager, uh, used to previously work with DVR and now is at the University of Washington. 80% uh, of her caseload is adults with autism spectrum disorder. And also with us is uh, Marika Wright as well. She's a vocational counselor with Division of Voc Rehab, um, part of DSHS, um, and uh, works with individuals kind of from the high school period onward. So again, for this topic of finding a job, really starting that process as you're hearing about kind of begins not just kind of after high school, but certainly kind of during those formative years in high school. So without further ado, uh, we'll, oh, a uh, couple things. Have to make the note that if you're in here, if there's an emergency exit uh, noise going on, don't use that door, it's blocked, there's construction there, so back that way. Um, also, uh, uh, we'll try and get a microphone around if you have questions, just so people can kind of, uh, at the external sites, can hear the questions. Uh, try to refrain from uh, providing any uh, protected health information about yourself or about your family members. This is recorded and goes onto YouTube, so do keep that in mind. Um, uh, and uh, the last piece of information is, what is the last piece of information? Oh, uh, the external sites, if you're logging on, if you have questions, you can unmute uh, to ask those questions and then make sure you get that mute back on just so we kind of maintain our good audio uh, for the talk tonight. So without further ado, we'll start with Richard Wilson. Oops, the mic works. Okay, now it's working. Um, I'd like to thank the Children's Autism Center for having us. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank everyone for being here tonight. Um, it's always uh, a joy to get out in evening traffic, right? And you guys um, made the effort to be here. Thank you very much. Um, my hope tonight is to cover kind of big pictures, cover these issues. I talked to... Um, a number of folks throughout the year in my current role. I typically talk to families, but I talk to a lot of teachers. I talk to other professionals and some people who are experiencing um, some type of disability. And what I run into the most since it's uh, the transition years, um, and sometimes younger, often younger, is, is happening more, which is a wonderful thing. I find that people really need to kind of get their bearings. It, um, the specific stuff is going to come later. And um, so I generally start with the big picture, but I do that recognizing that there's never going to be a room where people are in the same place. So some of you are going to already have a deep understanding of a number of these areas, and some people might be new and fresh at it. But you have to start with, you know, I've got to see the forest here so I know where I'm going to go. And that's one of my objectives tonight. Um, and along the way, I hope to leave you with some resources and possibly where to turn. Um, but I don't know that anybody fully knows the whole big picture and nobody, and nobody really knows all the resources. So I hope to share with you, with the time I have tonight, um, what I know. And, and then, of course, Marika with VR and, and Maureen uh, with the University of Washington are bringing in more depth in their areas of experience. What I've done in this PowerPoint is, um, with the resources, I've got some pace to run in, but I've tried to embed links in it. So assuming those links work, um, I don't have handouts. You can click on these links and you can 
follow them and go to town. And if you find better stuff along the way, uh, email me. <laughs> and hopefully I'll save that where I can remember. Um, along the way, I want to um, offer you some strategies for success. I was told not told to put the mic somewhere better. Sorry, everybody. Um, because there are certainly things we're learning, and the greater we are learning, that if you can use those as um, practices, we know that the opportunities for becoming employed, especially before you leave your high school programs, are going to go way up. And so that's something I want to focus on tonight. And then I'll feel like I've done my job if you know what your next step is. So I hope, that's, I hope this is going to be helpful for you guys. So in speaking, and again, mostly with families, but I, I'd be really interested knowing if you have a different role, if some of these questions um, hit home. These are a lot of questions I hear. Um, can my student work? How can my student work? Or why should my student work? What kind of jobs are there for my student? What support is there for my student to work? What is this DDA, this DVR, SSI? Why might I need to know this? My student can't afford to work. Won't he or she lose Social Security benefits? Why do I need a special needs trust? Should I get a guardian? Should I get guardianship, or is there something else? Where do I turn? What steps should I take? What if I mess something up? How can we keep my student safe? Why would I want my student to get Medicaid? He or she has coverage. How do I help my student get Medicaid? What about transportation? What don't I know? What don't I know? What don't I know? Are there other, does this hit home, I guess? For those of you, yes, somebody here in the audience is saying yes, and for those of you at home, um, I can't see what you're saying, but you can, you can um, call in when we have, between our sessions, we're gonna have some quick questions and answers, and at the end, we're going to try to do some Q&A, so. Um, but does this seem to ring generally true? I mean, yes. Transition's complicated. I'm going to cover some of this big picture, which is a snapshot of these crazy systems we've built, and these big bureaucracies, um, amongst a number of other complexities. And um, this is where people's heads go, and rightly so. So again, if I'm going to help you understand the big picture, the biggest, the largest framework I could really think of as I was putting this together is this difference between entitlement and eligibility. Now, as for those of you that are here, how many of you are familiar with this? Okay, for those of you at home, maybe about a third of the group here have heard this difference. And essentially, an entitlement guarantees that if you qualify, you're going to get the benefit. Okay, you're obligated to receive it. An eligibility program, if you're qualified, um, you might receive those benefits, but they're not guaranteed. And that's the fundamental difference. How many of you here have an example of that? Well, since we're here to talk about younger people seeking employment, the biggest uh, example of that is free and appropriate public education is an entitlement. And those services that the three of us here tonight are going to try to give you a quick overview of are eligibility programs. So that means if you're in special education, you qualify for that, you've, you have to get services. Of course, then you have to, you're supposed to get appropriate services and you have to advocate for the services with that school and work with them to get the, the best education and uh, transition services you can get. But when you get past school, what I say over and over when I meet people, that nobody picks up the phone, gives you a call, and says, hey, we understand um, Johnny wants to get a job and we'd really like to get you and get you an appointment right away. That doesn't happen. And so you've got to know about these post-school programs. You have to apply for them. You have to figure out if you're eligible and you have to pursue them, and you have to work toward getting them. To our AV person, I'm sorry I'm making noise, and to you at home, those of you at home. Now we're here to talk about employment service tonight. I'm not gonna get into details on this. 
That bottom arrow should be a two-way arrow, by the way. I saw that on the bus coming out. Um, but just know it's um, phases, and it's like a lot of services. Now, do some of you here work at Children's? Are you in sort of the medical profession or families? I mean, at least every service I've been in over this time period, you kind of have an intake. Is this the right service? You're asking for service. There's an assessment. What do you need? Um, you build up a, a plan to address those needs. And in employment, the assessment helps inform the job you're going to seek and the kind of services, supports you need to get that job. You get the job and in, in supported employment anyway, and we're not here to just talk about supported employment, but there's extra training that goes along with that to help get you to the point where you're meeting your employer's um, requirements. And then um, in the world I work in, and uh, my colleagues here are going to talk more broadly, there is um, supports that help you keep that job. But just know it's in phases, and then next month you guys have a couple of individuals who um, are part of organizations that um, deliver these services, right? And so I expect you'll, on top of whatever Marika or Marine may say today, you'll learn more details. But I just want to say, we're here to talk about employment. This is, again, uh, my high-level way of saying this is kind of what it looks like. I do that because a lot of, I, I, you learn when you talk with a lot of people, a lot of people don't know this. And again, people are in different places, and I want to try to give you um, broad framework. <coughs> now, if you're in a situation where you need support to help seek and keep a job, it's helpful to know the variety of ways that that can be funded. Because you need help. The folks that are going to help you are probably going to need to be paid. And so what you have here, and I'm going to have a few slides on this, you have the Washington State Department of Social and um, Human Services Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, Rehabilitation. We have a representative here tonight for that organization. Under the same state agency, you have DDA, the Developmental Disabilities Administration. Now, are these terms familiar to whom? Some, yes. OK. <laughs> and others, maybe not. Or you're shy. OK. Um, if you're in DDA, the Developmental Disabilities Administration, there's a small program that may give you a monthly cash payment that you could use toward employment services. It's really small. It's going to not get you many employment services, but you can do that. Um, let's go back counterclockwise to the 9 o'clock position. Um, SSA, what I mean is by that is Social Security benefits, of which there are different types. But there are programs within Social Security benefits that can help you pay for employment supports. You get involved with Social Security, and I think the three of us would be recommending that tonight. Um, you're going to need to know, in many cases, about savings and special needs trusts. Okay. You're a youth. You're going to want to know about your school programs. What are your schools doing toward um, helping you become ready to work and giving you the kind of experiences you need and opportunities you need to be successful? And at least in Washington State, because every state's organized differently, you're going to want to know how your county might be involved as well. And then, of course, there's the last piece, the out-of-pocket piece. There's direct payment if you're going to pay for that service. The two biggest funders of that in Washington State are the two agencies I first started with under the Department of Social Health Services. And they are the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, which Marika is going to go into in detail with you tonight. And there's the Developmental Disabilities Administration. Um, in a broad brushstroke, DVR serves a whole lot of different people, right? And DDA serves people who meet their criteria for developmental disability, OK? DDA, th these are broad brushstrokes, you guys. DDA is whole life not just employment, but they also pay for employment supports for people who um, are seeking employment and qualify for their services. DVR is employment, and I'm going to let Marika get more into that. Um, both could be available throughout your life, but DVR would be intermittent or more time limited, right? And uh, DDA, um, sometimes you may lose your eligibility, but typically if you qualify, you're going to be in for life. Now, you may wonder why county guys around or whatever other things you're in. I work for King County. That's because in Washington State, in the late 60s, the state decided that day services would be administered by counties. Employment is a day service. 
So really, probably the only time you really even need to know this, probably, other than knowing where some of your tax dollars are going, um, is if you're in transition right now and you're in DDA. Um, because I would probably at least meet most of the f families and some of the students, and I'd be working with many of the teachers and collaborating with DVR to provide the resources and some service structure for the folks there that are our contractors. We mostly outsource those employment services from the circle I showed you to these mostly nonprofit but also for-profit private entities, okay? And um, again, I mostly know the DDA or the developmental disability side of the world. I can say that these, these agencies are dedicated and committed to helping individuals with disabilities uh, obtain, uh, seek and obtain employment. They're very passionate about this, and that's what they're here for, and we contract with them for that. Now, to circle back just a little bit, I want to reemphasize the point. These are not entitlement services. So no one's going to pick up the phone from Social Security, from my organization, from DDA. Now, Marike is awesome. Maybe she'll pick up the phone. She'll be out in the schools trying to find your kid, but really, no one's going to pick up the phone when at June 18th, the year your student turns, has turned 21, and say, hey, uh, we need to get you down here. So it's not an entitlement. You need to get qualified. You need to knock on the doors. You need to find out what you're qualified for. And it's really driven by you, really. Bigger picture, all of this has been driven by families from the beginning. It's families advocating, and family. that's why you have special education. It's why you have the DDA side of services. I only know that DVR started after World War I, but I bet it was citizens, probably families of vets, veterans that got DVR going. And so what I like, a reason I like to share that is you may not feel very powerful all the time. Um, how many of you have school age? family members or are a school age family member. Yeah, so you're in IEPs a lot. You probably have rules, right? Um, how many of you are post-transition? And so you're dealing with guys like me, right? And you're negotiating what you want and need, right? You, you can leave a job vendor, and we can talk about that more later, but it's difficult, <laughs> yeah. Because, oh, well, we, we should talk to you about that on the side, because I know Marika can help you, and I can give you some tidbits. I will say just, we have to be honest, it, there just isn't always another employment vendor ready. If you need to switch vendors, you have the right and ability to do that within the real world restrictions of the next vendor's capacity, or knowing how to navigate, knowing who to talk to, figure out how to hand that off and do all that timing. And let me, I'll also, if it comes up, talk to us afterward, leave some out to Marika, because I bet you, you're really close to that. Oh, Maureen, you have the rock stars over here, I have to tell you. So, um, and I don't get to work with Maureen so much anymore, so I'm just gonna be. Um, anyway, my point here is, is you've got to practice. I, I, I liken it to learning an instrument. And they say the way you're going to learn an instrument um, is even 15 minutes a day. You sit down and you do the fundamentals. And you do something every day. And we're going to give you some tools here tonight so that you can stay focused on that. And um, that's one of the ways you make it work. But I also want you to know as families, you have power. And together, you have even more power. And I think it's critical that that be remembered. But there are predictors um, of things you can keep your eye on um, that may, that should and uh, maximize. Now, I see that it's hard to read, and I, I realized after I made this, my um, snippet did not come out very clearly. But predictors of post-school success, I've given you the website, and I've given you the link. So the link should work, but you can find it through a simple search on the website. And you're going to find this is a pretty big website. <laughs> and um, you're going to find stuff about um, promising practice, research-based practice, and evidence-based practice on this website. 
So if you need to practice yourself a little bit every day, this is one of your resources. And you can go in and you can see um, things you might be able to focus on to help maximize the probabilities that your family member is going to get to keep a job. I highlighted employment because this is what we're here to talk about tonight. It's nearly impossible for me to read as well. We're going to drill into a little more. But on the bottom one, you're going to find things like parent expectations, program of study, um, work experience, transition program, OK? These are things for you to keep your eyes on, OK? We'll get into a little bit more. Another one that's a little easier to read, which I thought was interesting, are these areas that are predictors that will lead to outcomes. The middle line's employment. These are all stronger predictors for employment than either education or independent living. I don't know what that means. I just thought it was interesting. But again, I've got the link for you there. So I'm trying to provide you resources the best I can. But our focus for today, and I picked these areas because um, having had the privilege for the last seven years of managing King County School to Work program, um, before or during when some of this stuff was being discovered on a more of a national basis, these are areas that I'm more familiar with, one, but two, that I've seen um, as indicators of success, what I think got incorporated in um, working with DVR and working with schools and working with these employment providers that are, I think are keys to success. So I want to highlight tonight collaborative networks, work experiences, and expectations. I think those are areas I want to focus on, and I would encourage you as you are on your journey to do so as well. But it's all about tools as well. So what I would say here, we're going to talk about expectations. We're going to talk about needing a team. None of us can do it alone. I can't, it, it doesn't matter whether you're a parent or an individual with disability or if you're Marika or Maureen Roberts or myself, we all need one another to make this work. And um, my teacher contact list, I can't even remember the number now, is really huge. But it, what really works well is when we're doing a lot of good communicating. And that, that it doesn't matter whether you're doing what we do or doing what you do. Um, you've got to do it together. And one of the ways to stay on task is to start now and to use checklists. And we have a lot of checklists to share with you tonight. Marika was showing me a, a great one that she has. And then what I understand, and I, I brought a little bit of information for you so you don't have to take my word for it. The single biggest predictor whether your family member is going to be employed after their high school program is work experience. And some of the literature will say paid work experience, which must be the case. However, I can say in the school to work program, our individuals get work experience that often isn't paid, and we have nationally leading job placement rates. So I think it boils down to work experience. Yes, a question. Sorry. Yes, uh, it could be both, but um, my experience is with the 18 to 21 programs. And they should be, really, they should be highly focused on helping your family member be ready for employment. I've had teachers tell me, like, 70% of what they should be doing should be focusing on employment. Yes? Okay. Um, did that start to answer your question? So I was told I need uh, to repeat the questions. Your first question was work experience when? Is it high school or is it one of these post 18 to 21 transition programs? I think it's work experience. I think probably you're mostly going to get that, although the world's changing. And I'll leave that to Marika with some new things DVR has coming up. Um, the work experience I've seen has been in those 18 to 21 year programs. 
and I've had teachers, okay, I'm repeating, you guys heard my answer, the question was that, and then your second question? So if your student wants to go on to college, what does it say about work experience? I don't know how to answer that for sure. I think work experience is good in any case. Are you talking about an individual who wants to work and go to school or go to school and then seek employment? Yeah, I didn't drill down enough to know if the literature got that detailed, but, and I'll let these guys jump in too. But I think about our lives growing up, <laughs> if I can remember. Um, all the work experience you can get, I think, is very important. So why not get as much as you can and, there's noth and then seek college so that you can then go have the double, um, ex the, the double set of experience to get a better job. I, don't, I would say never forego authentic work experience. Most of the folks I work with learn by doing, right? And, um, and they need to be authentic experiences that are, as, uh, that are like real work. Um, why hope that generalization will occur? Why not? Um, one of the best transition programs in King County, the motto there is the community is the classroom. And they get 80, 90 percent of the individuals in that 18 to 21 year program jobs. So uh, this is one of the tools. So one of the one of the tools is um, a timeline. And what I'm doing is you guys need to know. Again, this is largely developmental disabilities focused, for, um, but it's much broader than that. It's rich information. I think you need to know about the uh, Washington's Informing Families website. I give you the link there. This is one of the tools that's probably aging a little bit, um, but it gives you, and, and Marika has even a more detailed timeline. But what's nice about this and the one that she's gonna show is it says what you should do at what age. Because since it's not an entitlement, I think it's about strategically positioning your family member to have access to what's available at that time. And at least from the, um, developmental disabilities, the DDA side, we go through funding cycles. And some, th I went through about four years when I first started with School to Work, and then a couple years before that, where it was get a job first and then we'll give you funding. And so go to DVR, get a job, go through the School to Work program, which was a combination of county and DV DVR funds. And if you didn't have all that set up at the right time, you missed the window. You missed the 12 month window. And so you always need to be positioning your family member. And this really, these timelines with ages really help you. Now I added a balloon there, and Marika will talk about it more. This is a little old, but DVR is doing some new things where you can uh, request earlier services. And depending on what county you're in, find out what the county's doing, because King County School to Work, if your student can qualify that, you can start one to two years earlier than would have been traditional at a certain point in time. Um, breaking news, I just got an email two days ago. These two links up in the upper right-hand corner are brand new. Um, they're updates from DDA. Um, a, a roadmap to services has another timeline. And it talks about some of DVR stuff, and then there's a, a new pamphlet on their guide to eligibility and such. So that just came out today. Fortunately, Dave and I, David and I talked, and I slapped that on there like last minute, um, hoping that you guys would have access to those links. I apologize for that. Um, you have my email, though, sir, but everybody will, and I can send you the links. And David's saying he's adding the links to the YouTube information. Great. Fantastic technology. Here's another nice checklist. Again, I want to keep moving along here. It's on that Informing Families website. Sometimes things are better linear. Do it by age. But not everything you need to do to have your family members strategically positioned is sequential. If you have the bandwidth, and depending on how old your family member is, you can do some of these things at the same time. Um, I would say if you can, take it in bite-sized chunks. 
Try to follow those age ranges. But remember, you're positioning. You're positioning your family member. So here's what families say about expectations. Let's move on to that. So I've got you some checklists and timelines. We've talked about positioning your family member. But I ask families who have had some success, what kind of things are you doing along these expectations? And I think the thing that stuck out to me, I remember this mom saying, well, at dinner we talk about what do you want to be when you grow up? What are you gonna, when are you going to work? You know? Well, you can start getting the job at 16. You know, it was just kind of the culture of the household. And that's the thing that really stuck with me. But, you know, it's be responsible for your belongings. Use a phone. Um, that was working as a matter of fact. That was that culture thing. Um, these kind of things. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I just listed them out, tried to put them in little funner bullet points. Um, you guys probably know a lot of this stuff. Well, the other thing that really stuck out when I was talking with her is it's ride the bus together. Go volunteer together as a family. So these were very supportive, like family inclusive things she talked about. And from, they stuck with me. Um, and I, of course, would be interested in what, what sticks with you. And as technology comes along, some of this sounds a little old, right? Like use a clock. Um, but expectations aren't just at home. And so uh, this is a little bit old, uh, but a couple years ago, we were poking around some data at the county and um, these are the num blue line is the number of people that were in service, and the red line are the number of people in jobs. And these are folks that qualify for Developmental Disabilities Administration. And again, I told you that the counties administer that. So we're the ones that hold contracts with those employment providers. And in 2004, a new policy was announced. It's called the Working Age Adult Policy. Um, it was the first state to have an employment first policy in the country. And it says, if you want to access day services, you need to try to get a job first. And they said, we're going to give you two years. And in 2006, the policy is going into place. So this is at least correlated. I don't know if it's causal information. But as of that point in time, and then the school to work program started in 2006, we start to see numbers served going up and number employed going up in King County. This is just King County. In 2010, DDA said to the counties, we're getting rid of a service. And it was a service that had a couple names. One was Pathways to Employment. One was Person to Person. It changed names. It was the same thing. It looked a lot like employment, but it wasn't really like there was a strong employment expectation in it. And DDA said, we're getting rid of it. Um, people can choose a different service, or they can go into employment services. Most people went into employment services, which had that expectation. And look what happened. Naturally, the number served went way up. But what strikes me, and most of those individuals had more significant disabilities, getting in that service and changing that expectation, look what it did to the number. So I'm a believer in expectations. How many of you do better when somebody believes in you and expects it, you know? I, I, I may be simple, but it kind of boils down to that to me. Think about maybe some of the bosses you've had over the years that believed in you. Go out and do it. You know, maybe challenged you a bit. Your parents, your teachers, your favorite teacher. To me, it adds up. But it's interesting to see that it might add up on a policy level as well. OK, I want to move along here and say that it really is important to build a team. This is something I adapted from school to work because we have like a set set of team members, the people that are involved, the people need to involve in the role. I was trying to generalize. But it really takes everybody, the student, you, the primary support, the school. But what friends and neighbors do you have? I've been amazed at when people do a, like a person-centered plan and they invite neighbors. I've had moms say, wow, they see a different angle on their family member and how valued they are. Um, parent networks. Parents are wonderful helpers of each other, and they can tell you the truth. And they can tell you the ins and outs. And they can tell you who to talk to who's going to really do the best they can for you. Service professionals, that employment agency, <laughs> for which one we need to have a conversation afterward. Um, public funders and services. And we can't do it without employers. And um, conservatively in King County, for folks with developmental disabilities qualifying for DDA, there are between 650, 700 employers, non-duplicated, for employing folks around the county and growing. Here's some info on work experiences with some links. 
So those are links that you can go see where I've just pulled the quotes. I was trying to find some good data. Um, what I find interesting is it's kind of old data. Um, and it doesn't include stuff we've been doing here. <laughs> and so <laughs> I think we see things a little uh, with a newer lens in some cases. But you can see that um, you're more likely to be competitively employed than students who have not participated in such activities. Um, most of the important findings from research show that work experiences for youth with disabilities during high school, paid or unpaid, help them acquire jobs at higher wages after they graduate. Yes? Mm -hmm. I think it is. Like I was trying to, um, so this um, person asked, said that I think, I'm terrible at paraphrasing, I think that work experience might be good in general. She was talking about going, people who are going to college, right? Is that a relatively good? I agree with you. I think get all the work experience you can. I, I can't think of a single reason why you wouldn't do it. Whether you're going to go to four years or eight years of college or two years of college in any capacity, whether you're seeking degree or seeking experience, get it. For people not qualifying for DDA, even though they should be, which is a whole other lecture series, um, how many employers are, Marika, do you have a number on that roughly because you got you work with a lot more? Okay. I have a link for you, I think, here. Uh, or you go back to that Informing Families website, you're going to find how to apply to DDA on there. Oh. Okay. Did you appeal it? So she's saying she applied to DDA and had hours of being turned down. No, I applied to DDA, but they didn't grant me the job. Okay. Okay. Refer her to the Autism Center. And um, I can talk to you after as well because I know some eligibility workers would be happy to to talk with you, and I, I am confident they would talk with you. Um, I think if you disagree with any of those, you really need to appeal them. You need to really get a deep understanding, and you have a family resource. So folks who have dialed in, I have two families here helping one another. Again, tap into your family connections. Um, and I lost my other point I was going to make. Sorry. <laughs> Here's some data on work experience. So obviously, I think my answer should be easier. Get work experience. Schools. Um, I polled our schools that we work with a few years ago just to get some examples of the kind of work experiences they have. I'm going to move on. I want to turn the time over to my partners. But I'm going to say that you're, you're, you need to understand that your transition programs need to providing, provide the best individualized work experiences they can as well. And you should be advocating and working with that and be partners and provide resource information to one another. Um, employment agencies should be providing work experiences. And we were talking about this before um, we came here tonight. They shouldn't only be relying necessarily on the resources that a school has. I know when I worked for an employment agency and I worked with Marine both in that capacity and later in the role I'm in now, I know I couldn't best serve my customer, the person I'm serving, without being out with them in a real live work experience. And I needed time with them. Um, and I would s suggest that you look closely at that. This is information that DVR at minimum requires that we've worked with them on in our collaboration with School to Work. Um, and then I've added you know, what it leads to and such. And here's where I just want to start to head to passing the baton to my partners. But I want to say if you do these things, we know that you will find success. I think part of my job is encouraging you to start now, to use tools. You need to know your next step, and you need to start it tomorrow. It's practice. Do 15 minutes a day, so to speak. But encourage yourself that it can happen. I've had a lot of families say, yeah, this is great, but it's not my kid. I've had that happen a lot. And I'd say, no, it can be your kid. You know what some of the predictors are. And just go to your... Um, 
internet search website of choice and type in King County School to Work and you're gonna find a link where we have like about 85 success stories that look like this. And some of these folks have very significant disabilities. They all qualify for DBA. Some have very significant disabilities. Or go to YouTube and look for the Wise Movies website. And you're up at 2 a.m., you're worrying about your kid, <laughs> you can't sleep, go do what you shouldn't do and look at that uh, blue screen, <laughs> that screen <laughs> that's gonna keep you awake more. But um, go listen to people's stories, listen to employers, say why they need and value people with disabilities and how they're helping their businesses. Go to the people working page and go to the school page. Watch some videos. And my point here is focus does get results. We have evidence of that. And you have predictors and indicators. Before, and I can only talk to you, I'm using King County School to work as an example. I think it's generalizable. Before the program, before DVR and King County came together and worked on this, um, wait, that's in a minute. Nationally, 19% of adults, which dropped from 22% in 2010, with intellectual development disabilities who receive day services are in some kind of community employment. The national core indicators show about 13% of adults. Not encouraging, right? Before school to work, it looked a lot the same. Before our agencies came together, we decided to focus on this. We worked closely with schools. We worked closely with employment providers. And after that, we start to see these kind of results as an example of what can happen when you focus and you have some of those pieces together. And I think that, that you can do it. Um, we're serving more and more individuals and we have an average placement of 60%. We want 100. And I'm um, really pleased in 2016 that we hit 68%. So I hope, this is really quick, this is quick. I hope that you have a better understanding of the big picture if you needed that. And I hope that, and I'd be happy to hear from you afterward that that indeed gives you some bearings on knowing the difference between some of these institutions we've created if you're seeking public support. I think I've left you with some resources and I'd be interested if you ever want to reach out, if those were helpful or what was better, if you found something. I think I've given you some at least information that you can form a strategy on and I think if you know your position in your family member that'd help. And I guess I'm curious, do you feel you know a next step, something you can do tomorrow? The audience is not raising their hand, viewers. <laughs> I hope, okay, somebody did raise their hand. I hope you can identify your next step using a checklist, a timeline, um, any of that information, and I'm here available afterward. And I wanna thank you, that's my piece. I think we were gonna say a few questions, but I also wanna make sure you guys get enough time. We're not too far off schedule. We're gonna try to leave time at the end for questions as well. Of course, I'll hang around, and I think these guys will too. Appreciate your attention. Um, thanks again for having us. And I'd like to turn over to Marika. Why don't we go to the, the photos. These are Marika's and King, uh, DVR's and King County's mutual customers in real jobs. Okay, am I working? All right, I think I'm working. If not, I've been a lifeguard in a past life so I can yell really loud. <coughs> so, there's some handouts that I put up at the table at the door. I don't know if everybody grabbed them. Um, one of them's a green book, the Student and Youth Transition Handbook. This is being updated kind of as we speak, so it's not completely 100% accurate, but it has some general information as well as um, kind of some success stories, like Richard pointed out with King County. And those are really great because it highlights not just our um, individuals that we work with with developmental disabilities or intellectual disabilities, but also our customers who don't qualify for those long-term services with DDA. And I think that that maybe kind of encompasses more students than we tend to think. Um, in the back of that handbook, I'm just gonna kind of give you guys a timeline to look at. So like Richard said, we do have multiple timelines to look at. On page, 34, 35, 36, and 37. There's some really great timelines to look at. I don't know what I did. <laughs> that start all the way back to, pay, to age 15. Um, just things that need to be addressed. Is this still working? We're good, okay. Um, 
so that's just something to kind of look at and get an idea. Um, so that's that. The other one is just general DVR services guidelines, how our process works. Um, and I'm going to talk about kind of how we run individuals through our services. Like Richard said, DVR is more related to short-term services. We're going to be intermittent throughout an individual's life. Um, really focused on employment. We're not focused on the home care services that are going on or any of those other you know, day-to-day -day pieces of life. We're really looking at employment and how can we get that individual employed in a setting that is a good fit for them, is using their skills to the best of their ability, and is keeping them as independent as possible in that job setting. <coughs> so, Again, we are also an eligibility-based program, so you have to go through an application process. You come in for an intake appointment, or I come out to the school. Um, we have a lot of transition counselors statewide that go out to the schools and meet with students while they're there. That way we're not pulling them out of the class, losing time where they're learning the skills that they need for work. So. We'll meet with them. We talk about what is their disability. And Maureen's going to talk a little bit more about the self-advocacy piece. And that's where some of those skills come in. Um, and talking about what are the barriers that they have. What is hard for them on a day-to-day -day basis and at work or in a work setting. So that we can start to figure out what supports does that person need to be successful at work. And then how can we provide those supports in the best way possible. Once we have that information, we have to determine a couple different things. Is, is their disability documented? If not, do we need to get some, um, slow down a little bit. Do we need to get some evaluations done? Do we need to have a psychologist meet with them to document that disability? Do we need to get medical records from a provider? Um, and then we have to determine, is that disability permanent? And are they gonna be able to benefit from our services right now? Most of the time, if you're coming to me through a school, you have an IEP or you have a 504 plan, we're going to presume eligibility right then and there. But we still have to document that information. Um, if you have Social Security benefits, we presume eligibility. Again, we just have to still document that information. Once we make you eligible for services, we start to go through that exploration process. And it's a little different for every individual that we work with because everything that we provide is very individualized. So for our students, which is a primary part of my caseload, is I'm working with students anywhere from age 14 all the way through that 18 to 21 program. And so our 14 and 15 year olds, we're working on setting up group services where they're doing career exploration, they're learning how to write a resume, how do you present yourself in an interview? Sorry to say you don't go to an interview in sweats and a t-shirt with a hole in the back. Just doesn't work. That's not always known. So we work on those skills and we work on how do we present ourselves professionally to set ourselves up for success. Um, you know, we work on how do we answer questions? How do we talk about our disability? Do we talk about our disability in an interview or do we wait? How does that all work? So that is kind of some of those group services that we're working on developing. Um, we have a few set up statewide. We're working on expanding those, so I don't have a lot of information on that just yet. Once they're hitting about 16, when they're able to actually get out into these work environments, we're pulling them in if you guys advocate for it. I don't, again, I don't pick up the phone and just call every single person on the student list at a school and say, do you have an IEP? I don't have that kind of time. It'd be about 800 students per school. I have seven. I don't have that time to do. So the, the teachers pull me in who have these students on their caseload who are recognizing that maybe they're going to benefit from those extra services. I come in, I do orientations just like this and present those services to the students, to the parents, to the families so that we can start to determine who's interested in that. Um, and we can do, for our pre-employment transition services, we can provide informational interview times. 
we can provide job shadowing. We can do work-based learning experiences and skills training so that we can start to teach individuals those soft skills that are needed to be successful at work. How do you communicate with your coworkers? What topics are appropriate to talk about at work and what aren't? Uh, how do we tell that somebody is done hearing about your weekend of video game playing? So, you know, all those different soft skills pieces that aren't always clear cut. So that gray area that most, that some of our customers don't know. Black and white, yes or no. But that gray area where it's a facial expression. It's really hard sometimes. So we wanna provide those skills learning op opportunities so that we can teach those. We can get them in those experiences and we can let them test it out. And then we can come in and say, you know, did you, did you notice that? And then if they didn't, then we can talk about it more. Or if they did, then we can say, okay, what would have been something different that you could have done? Um, so those are just some of our pre-employment transition services. And we provide those throughout the high school time frame. This is for individuals with developmental disabilities that are connected with DDA, as well as those who are not. And that's one of our main focuses within DVR right now is really grabbing those students who do not have DDA, who need the supports, who need the help to get employed, so that they don't fall off that cliff at the end of high school with no services that they're connected with. Um, so those are kind of those, those services. Our assessments, we have a lot of different assessments we do. Um, they can be anywhere from online interest inventory assessments to uh, community-based assessments, which is again where we're getting students into a situation that is as close to a work environment as possible and we're testing it out. We're seeing how do they do. What do they need help with? Can they get to work on time? Is there transportation issues? Um, do we have, you know, what kind of supervisory styles do we need to look at? How do they learn best? Do we need written task lists? Do we need picture task lists? How can we provide the right supports for that student to be successful in the job that they get? From those assessments, we move into working with our vendors. Um, and we call them a lot of different things. Job coaches, employment service, employment specialists, CRPs, community rehab providers, a vendor. There are people that are out in the community talking with the employers and figuring out how can we get individuals employed in these settings that work for them. And then they turn around and they also provide those retention services to help that student or that individual keep their job. So we follow along with them for an additional 90 days from the day that they start the job so that we make sure that things are going well. This is really the down and dirty of the DVR process. So <laughs> if you guys have questions, please ask. Um, through all of this process, we're developing an individualized plan for employment. So we use a, a similar acronym to school. We use IPE, not to be confused with your IEP. We often do it, it's okay. Um, but we're developing that plan to identify what are the specific steps that that person needs to meet their goal. Do they need to go to school and get additional training? Do they need to get a certificate? Um, are we doing a food handler's permit because they want to work in a restaurant? Um, or are we really just looking for a job? What is it that that person, what's their goal? And what do we need to do to get there? And we identify each individual step within that. <coughs> Um, we talked a little bit about social security benefits. Um, those are impacted by working. So we do benefits planning meetings with our benefits specialists and we talk about how specifically is your social security benefit impacted. Um, and also about Medicaid, Medicare, what are those resource limits? What does that mean? And for those who do have DDA, how do we keep those Medicaid services to keep your DDA benefits. We're not gonna go into that today, we'd be here for another hour, so. Um, we do also work with quite a few different vendors and providers, so I work very closely with Maureen and her team over at UW. I work intermittently with King County um, through a lot of our contracts with them with School to Work. 
So we try and provide kind of a comprehensive wraparound service as much as we can for our customers that we're working with so that we make sure that once DVR is out of the picture, that they still have those continued supports that they need. I think I ran through that really fast, but I think I hit my 20 minute mark. Because I brushed over a lot of things, are there specific questions or things that you guys want me to go over a little bit more? So the, the question is about the STEPS program at the Highline yes. School District. I have not, but I don't work with Highline. Richard, have you heard of the STEPS program? He's gonna put his mic back on. Can you hear me? Yes. I haven't heard of the STEPS program, but if they're getting work experience, how, how old is your student? 17. 17, it's probably why I haven't heard of it. Um, but if he's getting work experience, they're probably, he's probably on track to go to their transition program their 18 to 21 transition program? I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm, <laughs> so I'm more. Yeah, every school district. Getting it earlier, yeah. yeah. And every school district has different programs set up and they have different names for it. Um, I'm, I personally am directly connected with the Bridges programs in the Seattle School District. Um, I, so I don't work with the South King County as much. There's another question. <coughs> question. About keeping, uh, you were consulting, uh, you're saying that uh, first you can get help with keeping your social security and Medicaid through DVR and then um, you were talking about a couple other places that could help once your child was not with DVR. And yes. I missed that part. Okay, so yeah, that's the part with the benefits planning. And so we talk, anybody who has social security benefits as they're coming into DVR or obtains them while working with us, we will schedule a very specialized meeting where we meet with our benefits specialists and we've got a team of them that we'll talk about how social security benefits are directly impacted by employment earnings. Mm -hmm. So SSI and SSDI, and then there's SSDAC for some folks, those all have different rules and regulations attached to them and how they're impacted by income. Because that in itself is a very specific topic, I don't wanna go into detail right now, but we can definitely talk a little bit more at the end. Um, Medicaid, is necessary to maintain DBA benefits. DBA, the employment benefits at least, are, and Richard, correct me if I'm wrong on this, um, but are paid for by Medicaid. So the waiver program that individuals get for employment services are a Medicaid-based program. So when we're utilizing DBA employment services, we wanna make sure that we maintain Medicaid regardless of the income level that starts happening so that we keep that job coach on site. Did I summarize that correctly? Okay. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Okay. Anything else? Yeah. So there are many people um, at Microsoft who are on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And there are people who are at Microsoft who are on the spectrum who are part of the Microsoft Spectrum program. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what is that? How does... Um, does it make sense to go into an organization and have people know you have autism so that they're a more able to <laughs> be ready for you? Or um, what happens if you go in and then people are confused and you don't tell them? It's a really good question. And it's, I would say that the answer is very individualized and in how do you want to disclose your disability to your employer? Uh, with that being said, I think the Microsoft program that they've got going on for individuals on the spectrum is a great employment opportunity. I don't know a ton about it. I've done, I've got a little bit of information on that. Maybe Maureen can well, answer. I don't need to know about that. Okay. I'm just wondering about the, the first question. I'm just curious about the first question. How do you disclose? Do you disclose in the interview or do you not disclose at all? How do you make that, how do you make that decision? It's a really hard one to make and that's really more individual. Um, 
and without talking to the individual, meeting that individual, it's hard to say. Um, sometimes a disability is very visible and that might be a time to talk about maybe some of the barriers, but how have you addressed those barriers and how are they not going to be a, an issue and that's something that we coach on. Um, and sometimes it's a matter of, you know what, if it's not an issue, if it's not in the forefront of a problem, then maybe we just keep it to ourselves and we don't disclose. Um, without really having that conversation with that individual, it's a hard question to answer. Can you go both ways? Mm -hmm. I've seen it both ways, yeah. More of a light on that. Um, I've recently created an autism empowerment kit for Microsoft um, for their suppliers to hire and support people with aut autism. And so to that um, question, if they're going through one of the cohort, cohort, cohorts, um, one of the autism hiring initiatives, they're clearly, Microsoft is gonna know that they're on the spectrum. And in my working with Microsoft and being in their supplier summits and having some insight into their accessibility and inclusion programs, they encourage um, disclosure. And I think that it, in my opinion, from what I've seen at Microsoft, it can only do good because they've got a lot of internal training going on to train their hiring managers and other employees on how to work successfully with autistic employees. So I think they're encouraging self-disclosure of all disabilities. I think in Microsoft is definitely, you know, in that forefront of being open about that. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's different with other employers as well. So it, and that's why I say it's very individualized as to how how we go about disclosure. But you've got a good point that Microsoft does do a lot of training around that. If you want to leave some time for Maureen and then we can open it up for additional questions and answers. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, I am Maureen Roberts and I worked for 30 years for DVR, which kind of tells you how old I am. And then I went over and started working at the UW in their rehab counseling department. And um, Dr. Stobie got his hands on me pretty soon after that. And pretty soon I had a caseload of about 80% of people referred from the Adult Autism Center, which has been great work. It's great work. Um, because I know a lot about DVR, I know a lot about public agencies. I also know a lot about how to get through those agencies and how to prepare for those agencies and, and all the kinds of hoops that you have to jump through and how to prepare for employment. So I think it gave me a really good advantage about kind of figuring out how to, how to get through there. Um, so I work with this guy, we'll call him Bill, and he's in his 60s. He's also a patient of the Adult Autism Center. Um, without any of these advantages that we have just talked about, he has never been employed. He has never had the advantage of working with teams of people or family and school support. Um, he cannot do his laundry. He cannot pay his bills. He has significant hygiene problems. He's never held a job. Um, he has trouble regulating his emotional outbursts. As a result of that, he's been to jail because people have misinterpreted him in the community. Um, all kinds of terrible things have happened to him, and which is exactly the kind of nightmare that you want to avoid, right? You want to you want to be able to um, to have your family member uh, grow up and develop and be as independent as possible and hold jobs and be successful and live on their own if possible, right? So the focus of, of my work at the U is, is I don't have any resources, I don't have any money, all I have is me. And I do a lot of rehabilitation, counseling, and it's all geared towards getting people ready for work, for school, whatever direction they're gonna go in. So I do, for the guy who's in his 60s, we talk about, okay, what's it gonna take for you to get to the laundromat? 
how can you do that? How can we get out the front door with your laundry? We've been working on that for months. For months, he did not go, he hadn't been to the dentist for 20 years and hadn't brushed his teeth for 20 years. We finally got him to the dentist. I was just so happy about that. <laughs> that was fabulous. Um, I, I work with a lot of people ranging from families with um, younger students, how to access resources, all the way through to people who are in their 60s. The general gist of uh, my population is in their 20s. And let's see if you, if you can relate to this. Someone in their 20s who stays up till 3 or 4 in the morning playing video games, gets up at 4 in the afternoon, has no friends, except for virtual friends, um, hasn't held a job, doesn't do any chores at home, has no expectations, has kind of like drifted along and has had no life really. And then they're coming to me and we begin working on those kinds of things. We start talking about things like, what are your sleeping habits? What are your eating habits? Are you getting any exercise? Um, do you have any friends? Do you have any social experiences? Uh, do you know how to communicate? How, are you a good self-advocate? Do you know what being a self-advocate means? How are your communication skills? Do you know how to talk to someone? Do you know how to interview for a job? Um, so we begin going through all of these things and, and I help them prepare for either going out in the world or getting a job or going to DVR. Um, in my office, we have the benefit, Marika comes to um, the UW offices once a week and takes referrals, but we can avoid that whole uh, mess of going to DVR and being in a big group of people and doing the paperwork in a big mass of people and all that kind of stuff. So we have that uh, wonderful advantage where we can kind of avoid all that kind of stuff. So um, I also, when someone comes to my office for the first time who's on the autism spectrum, I invite family in to come with, with them. But the second appointment, or sometimes the third appointment, I will go out and get him in the lobby and I might say, okay, mom, it's typically mom, mom is going to stay here and you're going to come in with me. I want to see how you present yourself. I want to know how you are advocating for yourself. Let's, I want to hear you speak because, you know, those of you who are moms out there, you know, we tend to speak for our kids and represent them and sometimes we need to uh, let them stumble through that on their own and learn how to do that on their own. So um, then we talk about transportation. So mom's not going to take you here next time. How are you going to get here? How is that going to look? How are you going to do that? And we begin working. We take baby steps. And for some people, I've been working with them for years and some people go away. They don't want to do those kinds of things. They're not ready for those kinds of things. But other times they come back and we work on it and we finally get to work with DVR and we go out in the community and we start doing all those fun things. Um, we talked about disclosure and I, you know, I guess it depends on how obvious a person's disability is. I often work with people who have, you know, unique ways of talking and communicating, and it's going to be obvious to someone that there's something different, right? And I refer to, um, I often tell people that they have a superpower. And, and so we need to focus on what their superpower is and then kind of work around the rest of it, right? And oftentimes I'll tell people, you know, yeah, let's talk about disclosure. What's, what are you going to say? You know, here's what I do great. Oh, by the way, I have this issue around communication and sometimes social stuff. And it would be really helpful if, if you saw me doing something that wasn't cool or, you know, didn't fit in or something like that. Would you let me know? Um, but otherwise, I do this kind of stuff really, really well. So, I mean, that's kind of how I talk to people around it. They like superpowers, too. So... Um, let's see, I left a green folder out there, or a green flyer. Kind of gives you an overview of what we do at the U. Uh, it doesn't really focus, it because I do work in the neurocognitive unit as well. I also work with people who have had head injuries 
um, strokes, that kind of thing, spinal cord injuries. So um, a lot of it's the same. So we talk to employers a lot. We do a lot of uh, work about FMLA and things like that. So it's pretty broad. Um, the, the, the one thing I can tell you, I have worked in the school to work program for a long time before I came to the UW and worked with Richard and King County. I can only emphasize how important it is to get work experience, as much work experience as possible, even if you are going on to school, because all those things that you learn, time management, uh, how to get along with people, how to talk to people, how to dress for work, how to use transportation, that's all so critical and important, no matter what you're doing, moving ahead in life, so. Um, referrals come to me through uh, your private practice or through the Adult Autism Center, um, a variety of means, and that's all outlined on here, so. Questions? I've left you speechless. <laughs> awesome. Great. Right. Do you want to bring uh, everybody up and open it up for kind of broader questions, or maybe there's any follow-up uh, from Marika or Richard, just um, as you were sitting down, you guys thought of different things that you wanted to get more elaboration on at all? Um, you know, Maureen was talking a little bit about some of those independent living skills and financing, budgeting, cooking your meals, something besides a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, um, you know, maybe something besides top ramen. DVR also helps with those skills as well. And so a lot of the time, if it's something that's really creating barriers to getting to work on time, not being hungry through your eight-hour shift, um, accessing those services like maybe bus training, how to use Metro, how to apply for a Metro reduced fare card, how to get access. Um, we connect with another vendor called an independent living provider, and they can come out and they can do evaluations, and they can do skills training and systems access. So a lot of those areas, if they're impacting the ability to be successful at work, we will address them as well through DVR. So it was kind of, the question I had was kind of answered by you, but I'm specifically looking at the school to work program. And my son is already, well, he's volunteering two days a work week during school. And he does do chores, um, but we have a lot of issues that go along with autism that are habits that he's gotten into, like you were mentioning not wearing sweatpants to, I laughed because that's all he's worn since he was six. <laughs> and <laughs> I, things like that, um, even though we've tried to break some of those, we've had bigger battles to fight than the clothing. Absolutely. And so um, I'm just wondering in the specifics of the school to work program, do they assist with some of those, trying to develop um, them losing some of those routines or some of those things you just can't do in a job? Transition programs. That, that really comes down to those transition services, right? And I would hope that the school to work program at that school that they're at is addressing some of those areas. And those are also areas that as an outsider who's not mom, who is not the teacher, who they don't have you know, a personal or long-term attachment or relationship with, that as a, as a vocational counselor, we can help address those areas as that outside person and outside perspective. Make you run, make you work, thank you. Uh, there was a nice thing you said about practice 15 minutes a day. What, what would you be doing those 15 minutes a day? So I was talking on the system level, I would say you need to be trying to hit those milestones on, on the checklist or the timelines. So at 14, are you contacting DVR or 16? 
So at the 14 year mark, so that's the youngest that DVR starts to work with an individual, we would, we're gonna be connecting them with our group services. And so those would be students who the teachers have identified as maybe being individuals who would be the best fit for early set services, you know, who, and really from a, from a counselor standpoint, from somebody who's done the job search and we all have, the earlier start, the sooner, the better, right? Um, everybody's gonna benefit from how to write a resume, how to write a cover letter. Um, the, the teachers are gonna be doing the, the contacting of DVR and letting us know. Um, we're also doing a lot of outreach and um, talking to teachers about what are our services. Um, it's amazing how many teachers don't necessarily know what some of our services are, and a lot of them are brand new. Um, we've just been doing some of these services for about a year, um, so a lot of teachers aren't sure how those are all working yet. So we're, we're trying to get that word out. Then, so on a systems level, again, at 16, are you getting a state ID? Um, as you're approaching 18, are you thinking about guardianship or not guardianship or something like that? I'm not promoting guardianship necessarily. Are you looking at um, applying for Social Security disability benefits? Um, so that's what I mean when I'm talking about the system level. Along with your daily expectations, again, it really stuck with me that that family member said that's just the, uh, the way I'm rephrasing it, the culture of the home. So are you practicing that? Are you practicing some of the things I think Maureen had some really nice detail on? What can you do at home to get, I, I worked with a guy who always wore Disney pajamas. It's hard, it's hard to get a job. <laughs> at least where I was trying to help him get a job. Um, so that's kind of what I meant. And when I was talking at the system level, make sure you're on those milestones because on a bigger picture level, you're positioning your family member to access resources. I kind of interesting uh, about the, the service you've been mentioned about the rehabilitation uh, counseling. Is it this is some kind of like the DVRs uh, uh, services? No, it's not. It is um, simply through the University of Washington um, has a rehabilitation counseling department. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the few in the country, actually, and um, there are just a couple of us in the department. <laughs> Yeah, it seems kind of new to me. So I haven't heard that. Uh, uh -huh. And I got a son, so he's 21 years old. Uh -huh. He just get out from school, so, and we just hook up so, with the supporting employment agency. Yes. And now it's in the process. Good. Yeah, and doing some so, assessments and doing some CBA. And I'm not sure so, he will benefit from this service. From rehab counseling? Mm hmm. He may or may not, yeah. Um, uh, that, if, if you're affiliated with the Adult Autism Center, you may talk to Dr. Stoby or whoever your provider is there um, about whether a referral is appropriate. They would probably be able to advise you more. And I just look at that, uh, he says, I need to get a referral from his PCP? Yes, that, that works too. Oh, okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so you had mentioned that like as parents we should be like doing that 15 minutes a day practice what should our soon-to-be adult children who uh, need to work on self-determination skills and self-advocacy what would you suggest that they do to practice because I know that at some point I don't want to be running the system for him I want him to be going to the system and getting his needs met because that's what my job is as a parent. Well, what, what's your name? No, okay. okay, no names. Okay. <laughs> okay, all right. So what I would recommend is um, uh, good participation in the school to work program, participation in uh, job and work experiences is really, really important. Um, I would say uh, chores at home as much as possible, expectations that are affiliated with perhaps money. 
So uh, he won't qualify for school to work because he's not DDA, and chances are he won't qualify for DDA. So, um, like, you know, the DVR programs, it sounds like those are fairly new. I know that some of that changed recently, like you said. Yeah. Um, but are there other programs out there and um, things so that he can be involved in? Yeah, so, I mean, if he's not qualifying for DDA, then definitely I would connect with DVR for sure um, because we'll be able to help address you know, what are those barriers and how can we provide the right supports to remedy or minimize those barriers as much as we can without those long-term supports in place. So what's going to be available for him on a day-to-day -day basis when we're not there? Um, and, and that comes with a lot of talking, you know, and talking through what is it that's going on each day, doing those community-based assessments, getting him into a real-life work setting and seeing what are those barriers and how can we provide the right supports for those barriers. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of reiterate Maureen and, and having those chores and really starting to notice what, what is it that works well at home to, for a motivating factor and what doesn't work well because you guys are the experts of you, not us. And so we, we rely on a lot of information that you guys have over the last 21 years of life to be able to provide And you've probably explored this, um, but are there t um, technology, are there apps that can help both help you with your motivation to, to get or to, to follow tasks or such and such? I don't know if you've tried that. some ways to limit what you can do on those as well on those yeah. devices so yeah. but yeah okay yeah i would too <laughs> i would too but yeah he's actually um he turns 17 next next month so okay my son will be turning 29 in september and he did first uh, meet up with dvr when he was in high school the special ed program manager got him hooked up there, and we had him going to SVI for computing. But my son is the, is the champion of passive aggressiveness. And if he doesn't want to do something, he will not do it. And that starts by losing, losing the um, packet of bus passes okay. and deciding not to go. And, you know, various, that and he also, well, long story short, he also had open heart surgery. So we had the first job vendor, we had health problems. We got back onto DVR. He did go to the community college. It took him seven years to get an associate's degree. But we got back, and through DVR, we did get him fine. His first time he was rejected for DDA. This time he did, because we also got the formal diagnosis, because I was told for a long, long time, he's going to be OK. He's going to be OK. He's not, and he has, you know, he has this social isolation, but he's literate. And the first, you know, the second job vendor, they had employment. The reason we had to let go of them, they had problems themselves keeping employer, employees to work with them. They either were fired for one reason, losing my son temporarily, and the other one for leaving for another job. So th he was just lost in that crack. That's why we hooked up with Maureen, and she hooked us up to UW Jobs. And now he's transitioning from DVR to DDA, but there is going to be a service gap there. But my, through DVR's help, he, we did get him on SSI, and I will use the funds for the private pay. Mm -hmm. And we're still working, it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's very difficult, he seems like a normal such, but he qualifies for DDA, he has this, when he is volunteering working, he gets that social thing and he works better and he behaves better, but we in the social isolation that he's put himself into, he's very difficult. Yeah. 
you are an expert now <laughs> on all this stuff. That's, I it's wish very I wasn't. <laughs> I know, it's very complicated. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think, did you have a question back there as well? I, I saw a hand at one point. The, the question that I had is um, actually getting your, <laughs> our experience is that one of the more difficult things has been to get our son to do chores. And so is DVR able to, because that's a way of building job skills, and um, are you guys able to help with a plan to, um, to get that going and sustained? Because motivation, turns out to be quite a big issue. Yeah. And the the list of instructions even for, you know, cleaning up the kitchen is a little more than than I had thought. So are you guys able to assist with stuff like that? Because I see that as part of independent living. Yeah. Yeah. I mean we can definitely we it would have to be very individualized again, like I've said, um, and talking with you more specifically. But I think that, you know, from listening to that, I would say independent living would probably be a good setup. But it's coming down to figuring out what is that motiv motivating factor for that person to do the chore, yeah. right? I don't know how many people here like to clean the bathroom. I'm not one of them. But my motivating factor is I don't want to go into a dirty one, right? That may not be the case for some of our students, <laughs> right? And so what is that motivating factor to clean the bathroom? And, and figuring that out. And that takes some digging and exploration. But sometimes we need to use each other's skills. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Some of that goes along with he can use the skill, he can use the laptop for a day. We also have a problem. He has self um, restraint problems. He has really hard diet, but I'll say, how can I add one a day? He's around two, and he says, not enough. He keeps them locked up now. And if he does not, One more question here at 8.30. Okay, I'll try to keep this easy. Um, I'm early on in the process. My son is only seven. Um, and everybody talking about services and eligibility and getting declined and getting denied, I haven't really applied for services for him yet. And I don't even know what deems you eligible. Is it how profoundly affected you are? Is it your parents' income? What do I have to look forward to <laughs> from you experts? Like. Is it really hard to get approved for DDI, and, and what deems you eligible or not? Um, one of the links on my, the, the slide that has the new links with the yellow star leads you to, one of those documents um, guides you to DDA eligibility, which would be a place to start. It is a lot, though. It's a lot, so just know that. There's three redeterminations. Um, what this family member, for those of you tuning in at home, was saying is the Arc of King County is they do workshops, but they're a good place to give a phone call to as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that might be your next step. And it's not income based. And one of the family members here is saying it's not income based. No. Negative. No. It's DDA is not income based not if DDA. you're under 18. Not DDA services. SSI. SSI is. would be. Yeah. Yes. It's very Social tricky. Security. Lots of word salads. Yeah. Right. We yeah. we all speak in alphabet soup. Yeah. Yeah. And all a lot of our acronyms all are very similar yeah. to other acronyms. So if if we use an acronym that doesn't make sense, ask. But yeah, SSI is going to be income based. DDA is not under 18. Under 18.
So are you are you saying you did have a DDA case manager? Yeah, so I was calling, but he never returned my call. I just called him and then we just started kind of giving up and he thought, well, once I'm kind of 18, maybe they'll answer the phone. <laughs> <laughs> How old is your you son? You should be getting an annual an annual assessment um, for whatever to keep a, continue to evaluate the paid service you're getting. And, and we can talk afterward. And I, but if you uh, wish to get a hold of me, I'll talk with you after this. I could help you seek out who the person is. And I could kind of help you get some contact, maybe help you figure out what you want to ask them. Happy to do that. We work with them all the time. Um, but you should, you would, there was a time where you would not have a case manager if you didn't have a paid service. Well, right. We don't have a case. We have so, been approved. So that's why you're not getting callback, probably, even though you should still get a callback. You don't actually have a case manager. And what I would say to everyone in the room, if you're in DDA and you're not getting a paid service now, there's a waiver called the Individual Family Services Waiver now. And you should ask, you should call and request it. And I can get you information. In fact, Informing Families, that website, you will find a way to access, how to, how, how to, how to request and access that on that website. And that would be a very important strategic position of your son to take get him closer to paid services. It, it, it would get you the Medicaid funded service mm -hmm. so that when you are older and you're getting an employment service, whether you start with DVR or not, you're already going to have those steps done when he gets a job. You're not going to find this gap. And it's very easy to, to bounce from an IFS a waiver to what we call a basic plus waiver, which is the employment services. They'll both do the paid services. We just, uh, on a DVR standpoint, we like to see the basic mm -hmm. plus waiver because that's going to be those employment paid services. Great. Well, let's give a big round of applause for Richard and Maureen and Marika. Thank you very much. I, they said they would be welcome to hang out here for a few minutes if you have other questions. And um, we'll see you next month for the second part, which is, you know, then now keeping a job. You guys are educated on how to find that job. It'll be no problem now. But then. <laughs> Then it's a whole piece about keeping that job. So next month is that. Thanks a lot for coming.